This is Eno Robinson, the voice of Cyborg, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Stone, comma, Victor, G, zero, eight. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome one of the newest members of the Young Justice team, Zeno Robinson. Zeno's voice acting career started as Alan Albright in Ben 10, Alien Force, and Ultimate Alien, and continued through shows such as Marvel's Spider-Man, One Punch Man, Big City Greens, Craig of the Creek, and of course as the voices of both Dr. John Henry Irons, a.k.a. Steel, and fan favorite Vic Stone, a.k.a. Cyborg, in Young Justice Outsiders. You know, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. That's kind of powerful to listen to you say it back. I'm like, wow. (laughs) (laughs) Got my radio voice on. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, wow, it's actually real. And, you know, I'm like, I don't know. We're going to get into that. (laughs) Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including up to episode 13 of season three, the comics and the video game. If you've not seen, read or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Let's do it. So I touched on a few things in this intro, Zeno, but could you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do out in the world? Okay, well, uh, uh, as you all know, I'm Zeno Robinson. I uh, live in Los Angeles. I'm an L.A. native. Lived there my whole life. I've been acting since I was like 14, which is when I did Ben 10. And I've just been kind of at that, <laughs> you know, the whole time. So, hold on, hold on. Just a second. You started Ben 10 when you were 14? Yeah, I was 14. When I did okay, I, I didn't catch that in my research. I didn't do the math. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, really we're cool. going to get into so, like. I was up, I was next to like Yuri Lowenthal and Kevin Michael Richardson before I had any idea who these people are. And uh, actually, Dwayne McDuffie, who's the, uh, you know, he created Milestone Comics, he wrote my episode of Ben 10. What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Before, <laughs> so, he, before he passed. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, it was quite a while, time before he passed, too, because it was, that was like 08. 08. Mm-hmm. God, when did, when did he pass? 2011. 2011. Okay, mm-hmm. so for those of our listeners, because we've, we've brought him up a couple times in a few of our episodes, for those of you who listened to my Rocket and Icon episode, I talked about Milestone Comics, but Dwayne McDuffie, if you don't know, is a huge influence on uh, the comic industry, uh, mm-hmm. helping to create and co-create Milestone characters that we're seeing in Young Justice now, mm-hmm. and has done a ton of other stuff. So I voice one, uh, the Holocaust, so... I know. Oh, that's right. You yeah. did Holocaust. Oh, mm-hmm. I forgot about mm-hmm. that. I didn't get Holocaust in my list. It's, oh, all, it's all good. It's all good. I'll remember for you. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> so you so you voiced Ben 10 at 14. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to jump ahead of this. I was going to ask you about this anyway, but let's talk about this now. So I read you, uh, read interviews with you talking about how there was quite a gap um, between some of your early work until you picked up a whole, until the floodgates opened. Right. Yeah, they're, they're and worse. you picked up a lot of stuff and you talked about the importance of both your investment in your craft, but also the power of your faith during mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, let's start with this right out of the gate with, you know, Ben 10 at 14, probably super excited about all that. And then having right. to work through all that through your teenage years. Benton was great because it it really it introduced me into the the cartoon industry and like how the process of that works and I was meeting a bunch of people who I suddenly started recognizing everywhere you know and I think just as a kid when you're on a show like Benton and you appear on it multiple times you start thinking kind of going oh like this is like my break this is when things will start happening for me <laughs> right. Right. And uh, I think even when you're not a kid, I think if you're an adult, you would also be like, hey, I made it. And then also yeah. suddenly, no, wait. And then reality kicks in and it's like, mm, <laughs> you know, you might want to. So after that, it was it was kind of it was a very dry, dry spell. And I'll attribute that to me as a as a kid, you know, who still had to mature into his work ethic. And also uh, just kind of the struggles in the industry about the kind of characters you, you get handed sometimes or like 
being you know there was a sp- specific amount of time diversity wasn't always in so you were i was probably always going up against a lot of uh a, a lot of big competition that i just couldn't keep up with at the time and i think it kind of came and then i got replaced on ben 10 and that was like what i didn't read about that yeah i got replaced um so a friend messaged me on facebook and he was like oh my gosh like i loved your your work in the newest ben 10 omniverse episode and i was like what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, I was like, thanks. So I was like, thank take- you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> did they take archive footage? I don't, I didn't know. I don't know. And then, uh, so, and it's something that happens in the industry, but I, I read that, that bumper Robinson had taken over the role of Alan. And I was like shocked because I didn't even get to audition. And I was still with, I was with my agency still and everything. I, I just, I never, got to audition they like never kind of looked for me you know and maybe it was probably i'm I'm attributing it to maybe it's a budget thing a time thing uh oh you're here you're available we have this kid you can play we don't know where this kid went but yeah that was that was pretty devastating you're kind of breaking my heart along with you here though (laughs) i mean i mean because i mean you 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 get this part and you're doing this part right Mm -hmm. you'd think that I don't know I guess being an outsider not a voice actor I would I expect like if my boss is going to replace me at my position they could probably let me know tell me right yeah right I and, and but that I know it's different in different industries of course but mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. what yeah like it okay. was sad it was especially because that was my first you know that was my first role and yeah like, uh you know I I, I I had the the bobblehead toy, you know. I had action figures. I was excited, you know. I was uh, <laughs> I, it was my first time on TV, you know. It was like, <laughs> and yeah. So it all came into a head, kind of, because you know, you you audition and you it's uh, acting is hard, and it's like you audition and you 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 shoot for it and you you give your heart into something, and then you know, then they go in another direction and things like that. So keeping your your faith into something, into like kind of. Either whether it's yourself or me, it was, you know, a higher, a higher kind of thing for me. I, I, it's incredibly important because it kind of keeps you grounded. It keeps you like, all right, it's not working out for me right now, but I know that there's something for me. There's something for me in the works. There's something for me. If I keep, if I keep on this path, I don't see myself really doing anything else. I know I, it's, and it's also about trust, you know, like I trust that, that, I had to go through all of these things and grow through all of these things for a reason. Yeah. And I think Young Justice is the biggest indicator of that, that kind of victory through faith, that kind of victory through trust and perseverance. And if you don't, you know, if you don't give up and you, you keep trying to just get better and be be a better, be better as yourself and be better in your craft and your art, that you'll see the rewards from that. Yeah, because I think Young Justice is, is probably the biggest indicator of of the testimony and the realization of that faith for me personally. So how so you but you've worked on a number of other shows before this. So why do you say this specifically about Young Justice? Why Young Justice? I think because the other shows I worked on were original properties like Big City Greens. I actually got everything Big City Greens, Craig of the Creek, Young Justice that all happened in the same year. Right. Which is even more incredible for me. Like it, it was like nothing. And then it was like everything. And I was like, yeah. whoa, you know, this can't be a coincidence because like the year before that, like 2016 was the worst year ever. And I was auditioning for like some of my favorite roles, my dream roles and my dream projects. And they weren't go- they weren't yeah. falling through. They, they were falling through. They went in other directions. And these are things I'm giving my heart and my soul to, you know, and right. just, there's just a lot going on, like a lot of loss going on that year. And that's what I had to kind of rely on trust to be like, all right, whatever you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. And I just have to, I'm just here for the ride. So I say Young Justice because I was a fan of the show before being on it. You know, like it was (laughs) my favorite show before being on it. You know, like I think that's different from like Craig the Creek, which I liked as soon as they gave the script in my hands, as soon as I knew that they were making it. But Young Justice was a thing that was it's, it was returning and it was already like top tier for me. I was like, this is the right. best show Cartoon Network has came out with in years. Like this is the best DC show in ever like since, uh, I, you yeah. know, I put it at the top of DC shows ever to exist. 
Yeah. We're huge fans of, of Justice League, Justice League Unlimited, of course, mm-hmm. Batman the Animated Series. Static we're we're fans of all that. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely static. Like Batman Beyond, like all of these all of these shows. We love them. Yeah. They're all they they all help lead to Young Justice being where it is, both in, in writing and right. in presentation, voice acting, plotting. Like we hear you. You can love those other shows and yeah. still like Young Justice is is pushing the envelope. I think so. And I auditioned for Young Justice when it first, when it was being made. Oh, yeah. When it was first being made. Uh, I remember uh-huh. the Kid Flash sides, the Aqualad sides. So I think that just because, and because this was something I wasn't expecting, you know, because it was something um, that I didn't expect would happen when I, when I got the audition, when I went to the callback, you know, I didn't expect any of it. So I think that's why I, I, I consider Young Justice as the kind of, the kind of, the, the the realization of that because it meant so much to me and I didn't I, I, it's not like I never wanted to be on the show I just never had a desire I was such a fan you know I never wanted to go uh I, I was cool being on it or not you know I was like as long as right. it's coming back and I get to watch it I'm good yeah so let's talk about this that process a little bit here because mm-hmm. There's some special aspects of Young Justice, right? So when the first season came out, we were talking to voice actors like Crispin Freeman and whatnot. And they were, they were, you know, they were pitching, you know, like, okay, well, I did Superboy and I did, you know, some other characters. And, and, but they were listed. When we talked to Cam Bowen and Eric Lopez, they were like, we were auditioning for some show called Cloud Ninja. Yeah. And uh, I was Cloud <laughs> Ninja said. Blue and I had like a spirit guide that mm-hmm. ended up being, of course, you know, the, you know, the, the beetle. Thing. The yeah. scarab, right? And so, so for them, it was kind of hidden what was going mm-hmm. on. And, you know, we, we, we know a few things about the show. And uh, we speculated. We were like, hey, are we going to get Vic? Like, yeah. even, even in the first episode, we're like, oh, holy, like, hardware's in here. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and we're like, all right, so, so, so we're, yeah, so we're getting, so we're getting hardware name dropped, and I'm like, okay, so are they going to go with hardware, and they're going, are they going to do Vic later, or are they not going to do Vic? Like, where are the other, where are the other Titans, right? Yeah, and so then of course we get Vic named in the radio broadcast, uh, where he gets named as a football star, and then we, then we get Cyborg. So mm-hmm. his existence in the show was pretty secret. So, I mean, yeah. it's not like they're announcing Cyborg tryouts for Cyborg for Young Justice and the general public that got picked up. So what was that process like for you? Were you, were you, uh, was it Cloud Ninja season two that you were pitching? It wasn't. <laughs> Funny enough, uh, I thought for a long time, I thought Mal was going to end up being Cyborg in this iteration of Young Justice. Oh, that would have been interesting. I had a theory that it was going to be, because you know how Young Justice kind of changes some things a little bit. So I had a yeah, theory. Yeah, for sure. That it was gonna be Mal, uh, so, uh, you know. I thought Kevin had a kind of good voice for it, you know, because he's Mal Duncan, and yeah. Uh, and then he, and you know, Mal Duncan, he was in the Guardian armor, I think, and that was season two. So he yep. was showing traits of being a hero, and I was like, oh, he's gonna be cyborg. Like when they when they come around to that, they're gonna they're gonna change it up this time, and they're gonna make Mal Duncan cyborg. Interesting. And, um. So I got the audition. It was just called a Warner Brothers pilot. So they didn't hide it as much as they did with Cloud Ninja because Greg told me that he had to create a whole fake show. Um, he did. A show that I want to watch now. Actually. <laughs> right. Like I'd actually like to see that. <laughs> and I actually never auditioned for that when that came around. And But yeah, so I was auditioning for a Warner Brothers pilot and the character was Jack in the Box. And the description <laughs> was like he is an 18 year old football player who gets these superpowers in a freak accident. And now he's wondering, you know, he's questioning his humanity. And, and I was like, immediately I was like, this is cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> like you're not fooling anybody with I this. I was like, this is <laughs> cyborg. Like, I'm pretty sure like you guys aren't saying it explicitly, but I'm pretty right. sure this is cyborg. It's Warner brothers. And like, I've gotten DC, auditions before so it's like the same font you know um i just (laughs) didn't know what project it was for i didn't know i thought they were like doing a new like justice league movie or a new like uh oh right yeah uh maybe like they were doing like an earth 2 kind of thing with with and they want and cyborgs and earth 2 teen titans i didn't know what they were doing but i had a feeling it was cyborg i was like this feels very much like cyborg and even when i was auditioning i remember going i'm just gonna make it cyborg just just even if it's not like he's so similar to cyborg I might as well just do that. And then like a couple weeks later, 
I got a call back and um and I guess I've never actually got to fully tell the story. I've never actually got to fully tell the story. But a couple oh, good. A couple weeks later I got a call back. Um and it was really abrupt. It like like my agent called me at like at like in the morning, like, can you go to Bang Zoom today and and, and do this callback for this character? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, what, what am I? I'm doing nothing right now. I'm going to go right now. So I go and, you know, I'm waiting and I sign in and Laura comes out. She's the uh, she's the production manager and she brings me like all the stuff. And, you know, so I'm signing in and I'm asking her like, hey, just so I know, like, uh, just so I know when I get in there, who are the like producers of the show? Like, so I can so I can know their names. Like, and she was like, oh, uh, Greg Wiseman. And I went, oh, and then she was like, oh, and uh, Brandon VA. Brandon and I go, oh, I, was like, I know what this is. And she's like, oh, so you're a fan. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is my favorite show in the world. <laughs> like, nice. in the world. I was like, are you? I was so like, oh, wow. I was like, oh, now the pressure's on. This is freaking Young Justice. I'm auditioning. I have a callback to be Cyborg in Young Justice. <laughs> so I go I in I wish there. everybody could see your face. <laughs> they could hear it in your voice, but I, your face is priceless. Literally, Laura and Marlene, that's like, that's all they tell me. <laughs> you know, like they say it was such a great moment. I wish everybody who's a fan of this show could see my reaction upon getting the news that <laughs> that one that this was Greg Wiseman and Brandon Vietti who like all their stuff is amazing and I love I love all of Greg Wiseman's shows. So like anything he puts his hands to, I love it. Spectacular Spider-Man, the first season of Star Wars, Rebels, Gargoyles, I mean Come on, Brandon does everything Batman. We dis- we we discovered that Brandon yeah. does everything Batman. And I just uh, and so I went in, and Jamie was there, and I just asked. I was like, "So, this is Cyborg, right?" And Jamie was like, "This is Jack. We're gonna do Jack now. So we're just gonna focus on that." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> you know." And uh, and I kind of just I usually when I get stuff like this that I really really want that I want my whole heart, I don't get it. That's kind of how like acting works sometimes. This is kind of what I was touching on on Faith. So what I did before reading is I have this bracelet. It's like, oh, you are enough. And I just kind of said a little prayer. And I was just like, all right, like you're going to do whatever you want to do, regardless of what I do. So I'm just going to do what I do. And hopefully it'll work out. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like I'm not going to let this destroy me <laughs> if I don't get it. Right. So I kind of did the thing and. You know, I, I came out and I thanked everyone. I thanked everyone just kind of like, I was like, wow, it's crazy to be here. I really love this show. This is like my favorite cartoon in the world. And just being here and reading for it is incredible. So thank you. And Jamie goes, yeah, well, you know, sometimes you you, you, you go for it and, you know, you, you don't know what happens after that. So, you know, and then I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get that. And then Jamie goes, um, should we tell him? And then I'm like, tell me what, <laughs> you know, and then um, Brandon just goes, yeah, so, um, you know, we want you, we got, you got the part. We want you to play, to play the part. And I was like, oh, <gasps> and he was like, yes, yeah, so as you know, like, uh, you're going to be playing, uh, this is Vic Stone, this is Cyborg. And I was like, I mean, when I tell you, like, I, I exploded <laughs> very similarly to Vic, <laughs> like, uh, I exploded i like i was jumping and i was like literally bouncing off the walls and marlene was in the room and i was like oh my god i'm gonna be a young justice like you guys aren't kidding with me right you guys like aren't gonna say this to me and then like replace me in like two weeks because that would suck like please tell me you're not kidding and they're like no like we want you to play and then they were like and thinking and you know there's a lot of characters so maybe possibly steal and i'm like oh my god and you want me to play another <laughs> you know i'm just like oh i was like this is the craziest thing that ever happened to me and then they're like well we're glad you're excited uh give us all of your your tuesdays and thursdays or i think it was the wednesdays i think it was like they they recorded a specific day every week so they're just like just free up all of those days and i was like yes i don't care i don't care what i'm doing that day i don't i don't care what i'm doing um funerals it doesn't matter <laughs> you know, like, uh and so you know i, I left and I, I was i was jumping to my car you know because i don't know it was very it was it was, it was very much like a, a gratifying moment you know I've auditioned for a lot of stuff that I really, really wanted and I didn't get. So this is yeah. one of those things where, like, it's my favorite show. I'm, I I started off as a fan, you know, and someone who signed petitions. I signed petitions. If you, if anyone who's friends with me on Facebook, like, I'm always sharing statuses about like my. You know, I would always post when Young Justice ended, like, and I, even when it got canceled, I would be like, you know, Young, bring Young Justice back. This is a travesty. This is the most unjust <laughs> thing to happen, you know. 
And so it's kind of cool, kind of like when when I was recording it and doing the show, like sometimes I would look and something would pop up about like how how much of a fan I was of the show or how much I didn't like that it was canceled. And it's like, wow, crazy. Like years some years later, now you're on it, you know, playing, yeah. playing a pretty iconic character. This is a this is a, such a such a unique situation for, I think, mm-hmm. almost any voice actor, really, to play something to play a role uh, in a show like a, a straight up not a reboot or anything just a straight mm-hmm. up continuation third season of a show that you loved what seven year eight yeah. years before when you mm-hmm. were younger and mm-hmm. being able to be a part of it I, I can't even I can't even process that for you much yeah. less like <laughs> like seeing your face is incredible so you told us a little bit about that you were a fan of the show but what was your experience with these characters you know even before that like were you a comic fan did you did mm-hmm. you focus on the animation and read the anime you obviously watched the show mm-hmm. <laughs> before you were on it i was a comic book fan i don't think i was as heavy as a comic book fan when the show was on i was definitely yeah. a, a, a superhero fan um static shock was my favorite and I watched Young Justice. I watched Justice League Unlimited. So I, I always, I started getting into comics. I think maybe a little bit after Young Justice ended, but I was always checking up. I was always reading, like researching on Wikipedia, always researching characters' backstories and histories and things like that. And I think this show might have gotten me a little bit into comics. I, did, I think there was always like characters I did. They would always put in characters I just n- never heard of, and I was just like, "Who is that guy? Where are they getting all of these guys from?" Right. It's all. Right. DC characters or are they all making them up? And so right. like I would start researching more and being like, oh, that's actually a person. But yeah, my experience with these characters is uh mostly through like other past iterations, like so like Teen Titans and right. um and also through their voice actors and their work, you know, so through Kari Payton's work, you know, so now he's he was cyborg and now he's playing Aqualad, so it was cool kind of hearing the distinction. But that's pre- that's pretty much my history, is like past cartoons that I had watched um beforehand. So when I've talked to some other voice actors too, like again, you know, like Crispin Freeman or, or Vanessa, I mean, they're, they're talking about their, you know, they 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 went into doing acting, they they went and got degrees or masters or whatever it is that they got. You know, Crispin's also like a mythology scholar. It's all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You started when you were younger, <laughs> like yeah. you started at fourteen. So, um, you know, I I'd read that you, had, I mean, you had been doing kind of acting tracks. You'd been in stage stuff in school. Right. And things like that. But but first question, how did you veer into going from, you know, doing the standard school play stuff into voice acting? And then two, having like this one job that you had at 14, Mm -hmm. carry that through into being an adult. Did you did you know you finished up high school? You went to college, college, you have degrees and anything like where where did how did you navigate this? I fell into it. I fell entirely into it. I knew early on that I wanted to act. As soon as I I did a play in middle school, I saw a play in middle school, and I knew that I wanted to do whatever it was that was. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yeah. What was what was that? I want that. <laughs> it was the lo- so it was in middle school, and we st- we had ended class or we stopped class early to. They were like, oh, we're gonna go to the auditorium and we're gonna go see a production, and I'm like, okay. So I'm, and I remember it very very because I was sitting right, you know how they have the aisles, so I was sitting right on the edge. And the story started and is actually when a friend of mine, she started, she came up on the stage and she was in this mask. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. What's going on here? I had never seen a play before. <laughs> I think maybe outside of The Lion King. Right. And, you know, she's speaking into this mic so I can hear her through the speakers. And then a bunch of kids just run through the aisles. They run through the aisles and onto the stage. And I go, whatever that is. I want to do that. <laughs> um, so I, <laughs> I walked up to the, the, the teacher, the drama teacher, his name is Mr. Lisker. And I, and I just, I was like, look, I'm in like art or whatever right now. Like, how do I get out of that? And then get into whatever class this is. And he was like, <laughs> Oh, like you can't do that right now. Um, but next semester you can, you can join drama. And then, so then my mom took me to a program and then that program introduced me to my agents. And then I, I signed with my agents. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, hold, hold on, hold on. Don't blow past that. Your okay. mom took you to a what? She took you to a program? Yeah. So there was this program called All About Kids in uh in MLA. It was like on Wilshire. And what they did was they they like took like kind of kids like eight, like young to like like early teens, and they like did this like workshop. There's this I want an agent workshop where you did like maybe I forget like maybe six or eight weeks of like prep work, and then you you like prep a monologue, and then you prep a commercial, and you go up in front of a bunch of agents and you perform it. 
Oh my, okay, yeah. you're just, wait, you're just, okay, I grew up in this small town in Kentucky, so like, I get, I I, I have lots of friends who live in LA, been up in the LA yeah. area, I get that it's different there, you're blowing my mind right now. So you had like, like, it's like summer camp, but it's summer camp to get an agent? Exactly, yeah, it's like summer camp wow. to get an agent, yeah. Wow. You know, kids are like, are like a commodity in the industry, so like, you know, a lot of agents are looking for a talent they can cultivate and, and grow into like the next big thing. And so, like, you know, the day of, there would just be agents in, like, every every room. And then you would wait outside the room. You would go in. You would do your thing. And then you would go and you would go to the next room. It was it was very it, – it was very – definitely can't, like, very much like summer camp, very much, you know. <laughs> and two agents were interested in me. And Melissa was the one I uh, – from CESD was eventually the one that I ended up going with. And so I signed with Carolyn commercially over there. And she and I was just commercial at first. I was like just strictly commercial. But she had sent me this this thing for Ben 10. And this is before I had cable. So I didn't even know what Ben 10 was. Oh, interesting. OK, so I was I just like I did some research. I bought some of the DVDs and this is and I didn't even know that they were doing a whole other like iteration of the show. Like, yeah, because because the shows that you were on, I, I, I didn't follow Ben 10. My co-host, uh, Emily, the reason she watched Young Justice was because she was really just watching Ben 10 and Young Justice came yeah. on after and she got, it, you know, hooked in there that way. But so yeah. what you were doing, it, it, it's like, you know, Ben 10 colon something else, right? And so it, so it was a later, it was a later, later show, right? Yeah. And okay. I didn't know that. It was, it was Hero Generation before they called it Alien Force. Okay. And yeah, so I auditioned and I, I read it and... um. I I got a call that it was between me and one other guy and they were just deciding and then they decided upon me and this was before like uh you would get your scripts to the internet so like then when I got it like a guy would show up at my house with my script <laughs> you know and um, they didn't just mail it to you somebody showed did, up and gave it to yeah and gave it to me you know <laughs> so another question another question then um because I'm not familiar with the show is the character mm-hmm. that you're portraying in the in there was was that character did that character exist in the original series played by somebody mm-hmm. else or is this a new no. character for oh, okay. So yeah, you were the first new, first actor to play this character. Mm-hmm. I was the first per- actor to play Alan Albright, um, and he was based off of an alien form that Ben used to have called Heat Blast. But he was a kid, and he was part alien, and he was part part Heat Blast. Okay, so he could transform at will into his Heat Blast form and into his into his human form. Gotcha. Okay, and it was so cool. <laughs> it was <laughs> so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean like i'm in there with ashley johnson and greg sipes and yuri lowenthal you know oh crazy. You, you, greg sipes is in there as well and of mm-hmm. course he was kevin playing beast, D- playing beast boy and mm-hmm. yeah oh d bradley gosh. baker was there playing every alien um, <laughs> right of course <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a very incredible experience for a little bright-eyed kid to be like wow like that guy did like 15 voices and that guy you know yeah and then i just kind of uh you know i auditioned around um but nothing really yeah nothing really came through until big city greens until until remy and big city greens and then all of a sudden stuff and then everything opened so this kind of seemed in some way to happen to zara sarah as well she she came on and she also was like i don't know i I don't know who you are and then Mm -hmm. like three months later oh you're everywhere yeah Yeah. And, and it seems like the same with you like mm-hmm. it went for such a long time. And the other thing I wanted to ask about was, you know, so you had this agent for mm-hmm. like seven years mm-hmm. and didn't book anything or you just booked minor stuff or just literally nothing. Or did you pick up some other things here and there? I would like, get commercials here okay. and there. Gotcha. I might have done like maybe one commercial a year at the time if I was so lucky. But actually, they did drop me. <laughs> they did drop me. Interesting. Okay, they did because I just I wasn't working, I wasn't booking. You had you had mentioned something earlier, and I heard you mention this, uh, or I read you mentioning this in another interview as well. You made in a just kind of a quick comment about like there was a bit about you felt like your work ethic was involved. Mm-hmm. Now, can you do you mind digging in a little bit to that and about how yeah. that changed and developed as a teenager from someone who's on a show like Ben Ten, right? So like this was someone who who you know. 
Okay, so like I'll, I'll continue. So like I I went that seven years and I, and I just think that as a kid, you know, you gotta you 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 think you have kind of the world figured out. You know, you think you kind of have your process figured out. And I I was right. I was studying under voice coaches, so I was studying under like my my voice coach at the time was Tony Gonzalez, and I would like kind of do what he would he would say to do on, on specific scripts and things like that. But I feel like there was a key component missing in my work, and then I there was a time or there's a point in time where I stopped having fun acting and it became about getting the job it it became about i need to book this so my agent doesn't drop me and so i can make money because i'm not working or you know and and, or i just like you know i just wouldn't want to rehearse you know i would just i i I, you know so a lot of my work ethic was needed to be fixed i think um so like i would get a script and i wouldn't look at it and um uh, until like until like the last minute, you know, I wouldn't prep unless it was something that I really wanted. And then I would kind and then I, and then I would prep, you know, instead of treating everything differently, seeing value in, in, in it. So like when when I did get dropped, they brought me back because they believed me and they loved me and I love them for that. But I, t- I started I, that was my wake up call where I was like, all right, look, something is going on here that's not clicking with you. So I started taking more classes taking more acting classes and taking uh like I started studying under Charlie Adler and I was taking acting classes in college as well so uh it was like all helping me along the process of improving my work ethic does that make sense it does but I'm 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 gonna dig do you mind if I dig a little deeper here dig deeper okay if so you're you're talking about work ethic but when I think work ethic what I'm thinking of is is that you know that that hard that that you're, you're going to power through, you're going to get mm-hmm. through, you're going to do this, you're going to show up, you're going to do the work. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I had a work ethic when I was 15, <laughs> 16, you know, like I, mm-hmm. I ran cross country. I ha- I worked at a, maybe I did, I don't know. I worked at Taco Bell when I was 16 or whatever, like, and I showed up to work and I did my good did job the best I could. But mm-hmm. <clears throat> there was, there's some kind of thing that I'm feeling when you were telling that story about like, you know, you didn't want to, you know, you got a script and you didn't really want to read the script or you didn't go in and do that because mm-hmm. of the work. And all, I, all I'm feeling is like this idea of like, as a kid, were you thinking like, look, I put this work in. I've done a bunch of work already. I mm-hmm. just give me a, give me, I don't want to prove myself every single time, brand new, every time I do this work. Like I've done the work, give me the part. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Does that does that resonate with anything? Because that's what it it, it does. It, it it resonates a lot of the time when especially like frustration. I guess is what I'm saying. Frustration. I think every actor, everybody has their bad days. Everybody has their the thing yeah. that they didn't do that well on. The thing that they that they you know kind of could have done better. But I do think through all of that, there were there were a lot of times where I did do good. There were a lot of times where I did do good work. You know. I mean, I, I was, it was enough to get Alan, you know, I think, I think nothing had changed about the way I acted other than oh, yeah, sure. the desperation starting to sink in and kind of coming up and probably coming out of my reads, you know, um, where I, I was reading, not like the character, but reading like, I'm good, please give me a job, you know? Right. I see. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. I get that. And I, there is a lot of that, especially the ones that I, I worked really hard on, the ones that I, uh, there is a lot of just just let me get in there. Just let me work. Just, just, you know, I, I'm tired of having, of trying to, to, to prove to people that I'm good, you know? Um, right. And then like, when you look it up and you see who got it and you, you're like, Oh, well, I guess you should have told me that you wanted that guy or, Oh, that guy gets a million jobs, you know, like why right. does he need any more? Um, <laughs> I'm so but, uh, feeling uh, you. Yes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, and I think, but I also think that, that there, there was a, something changed. There was a, a process switch within me where I started just, I started kind of being like, no, like, because there would also be times where I would like prep and then I would go in an audition and then I, I would come out hating it. You know, I, I would leave like, I hated that. I hated everything about that. Like, what could I have done better? And then I'll like do a random read out loud and I'd be like, oh, I should have done that in the booth. Why didn't I do that in there? And I think once I stopped, it's like, I think it's still about that trust. Like once I stopped kind of placing this Mm -hmm. big pressure on myself to get the job and just have fun, you know, like I should love this. This shouldn't be a chore. I shouldn't, 
oh, I shouldn't feel this desperation every time. I shouldn't be sitting at the phone waiting for my agent to email me like, oh my God, please email me another audition so I have another chance to prove myself, so I have another chance to work. Okay, I'm getting, my anxiety is going up just hearing you describe <laughs> this. So yeah. like, but when you when you let that go, like when you let some of that go and you just started to be like mm-hmm. a little bit more as opposed to do, you know what I mean? I'm doing, I'm doing, doing, doing. Why can't people yeah. see me? Because I'm doing, doing, doing instead of doing that and just being in that space. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it had more to do with, it had less to do with let me be good reading the script so that they'll see that I'm good, right? I think it became less about telling them that I'm good through my yeah. acting. And it became more about being good, being truthful to what's in front of me and having fun and and as and whatever I can do to walk away and go, I did the best that I could do there. I can't ask of any more of myself. So everything from that point is out of my hands. And wow. and and kind of knowing about the industry, like you may be the best actor for the role or you may be the best actor, but you may not get the role. You know what I mean? Like, yes, like yeah, they yeah, might yeah. have a kid who's younger than you. And that's why he gets the role. Not because he's a better actor than you, a better performer than you, but he's 19 and you're 23. <laughs> you know, like yeah. sometimes it's been like that. Sometimes with the, my favorite roles, it's been like that where I'll audition for a thing that's really dear to me and I'll, I'll give it 100 percent. And uh, I'll know the people working on it and they'll go, well, the guy we chose was just a little bit younger than you. He had a little bit of that younger energy and we kind of picked him or he looked a little bit younger than you, you know. And so sometimes it's not even it's not even your skill. It's not right. even a measure of your skill. It could be whether the guy they picked could play three different characters. And, you know, if you if you can only play one, then, you know, they're going to pick that guy. So. Yeah, it seems like that had to that had to have been like a weight off of you, though, Mm -hmm. right? When you come to that realization and and own that a little bit, that it's not all about you or your need to prove. Mm -hmm. It definitely did. It definitely opened me up to it it changed the way I work, I think. And I think that was why taking that Charlie Adler class was really instrumental because he was like, yeah, all that training and stuff you did, throw all that out the window. Throw all of it out the window. Like, okay, really, what? he's great. He's like, he's like all that that marking up your script that you do, and you. What, what does the guy look like? You know, I remember I, I brought him. He was because the goal is bring something you think you're good at, bring something you think you're bad at, and I and I brought him the thing that I think I'm bad at, and he was like, "Why did you pick this?" I was like, "Well, you know, I have a kind of young voice, and this guy's old." He's like, "What's he look like?" I was like, "Well, he looks kind of old and angry and bald," and he was like, "Play that. Like, why are you complicating this? You know, just do that." <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's great. It's some of the best because it's true. Like I, I spent, so, I, uh, you know, I've spent so much time kind of analyzing to the point and there's nothing wrong with analyzing and marking your script. Sometimes I mark my script too, but when you let it go and just, and just do it, you know, some of, some of my, some of the auditions, some of the thing the roles that I book is when I threw it away I didn't throw it away, but I went, I'm not going to get this. So I'm just going to do whatever. That's how I did with cyborg. I was like, I'm not going to get this cyborg. This Corey Payne's role. Like, I don't even know why they handed this to me. <laughs> you know, like I don't even know why they even gave this to me. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just going to do whatever it is. I'm just going to do my best, my best attempt. And I started like kind of just taking advice from other people. A friend of mine, Gabe Kunda, he he says every audition, he's he's like, I can pretend like I already have the role. And I think that's such a great mind state to have. Yeah. Because I think that that frees you up to uh, from placing these expectations on yourself. So this class that this class that you took where this I, I, I didn't catch the teacher's name. Who's the teacher's name? Charlie, Charlie Adler. He's a voice actor. He was in Cow and Chicken. He uh Okay, the name um, sounds familiar. Cow. <laughs> yeah, he played Cow and Cow and Chicken and the Red Devil. Um, he's like Buster Bunny. He's great. He's a legend. Nice. So he he was he was it sounds like he was kind of telling you to stop telling yourself stories. Like stop telling yourself you can't do there is no there is no actual logical reason why you can't at least yeah. attempt this. Are you stopping yourself before you're even trying? You know, that kind of thing. You know, he's the one who told me if you are desperate for a job it's gonna show up in your reads like if you go in with that energy if you go into any booth any audition with the energy of please give me a job it's going to show up when your read will be please give me a job because that's how you're feeling (laughs) all your characters sound like they want a job 
Yeah, <laughs> you know, for a long time, they all sounded like, please give me a job. Uh, things are not going well, you know. Um, and yeah, it's it's there's a lot of growth and learning that I had to do um, before before this. So, yeah. So so can you tell me a little bit like growing up, like, did you how, how is your family? Is your family supportive of this? Do you have any mm-hmm. siblings? Do they do they yeah. work in the industry as well? Or Mm-mm. I'm the I'm kind of the only the only one in my immediate family who is like kind of into acting. Um, okay. I'm kind of a not a black sheep, but like it, it, my mom was like acting. No one in our family does that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, so I, that might've made it a little bit harder as well because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have like parents who kind of knew about the industry, who kind of knew, I didn't have like a lot of people around me who kind of right. knew what this was all about. So everyone was learning as I was on this endeavor. My mom is incredibly supportive. She would take me to every audition, every callback, like in those, in those teenage years, be the one, like you need to rehearse. And I'll be like, no, she'd be like, you need to do it like this. And I'd be like, no, I don't want to <laughs> do it like that. You know, uh, I'm an actor. I need to trust myself. Um, <laughs> and then the casting director would be like, you should do it the way your mom said it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, Hats off to mom. Hats off to mom, for real. Yeah. But is it hard to not having someone with any kind of common frame of reference in like in the family too? Like when you were having hard times? Like, did you have other friends who, I mean, did you have friends like when you were at school and stuff that were also trying to do the same thing? What's it like being a child actor trying to like get into the industry? In yeah, I did in high school. I had friends who also like wanted to be actors, but I also had friends who were actors who auditioned for the same things that I did and booked those things. So I was like, I don't like you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like you got that commercial that I auditioned for. Like I have to, and everybody's telling you how great you did, and I'm like, I auditioned for that commercial, <laughs> you know. And I had to stop doing that, too. Like, I had to stop, like, making my peers uh, my competition. Well, they are my competition, but I had to stop looking at them as competition, you know? Yeah, but they weren't. They're, they can be competition without being antagonists in your life. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, they weren't against you. Yeah. But I just, I didn't know anybody at school, even in the actors, the other actors who were specifically into voiceover. Like, I didn't. I didn't. Like, even oh. when I was doing Ben 10 and I was in high school and, like, my friends would see me and watch me in Ben 10, like they would be like, that's so cool. But no one, I think, was really into, like, they wanted to do film and TV. And I, I wanted to do film and TV too, but I think, and I'm going to, I think this this says something about the industry as a whole, but I think, like, a lot of actors and a lot of people, they they definitely diminish and devalue the work that goes into voiceover. So they prioritize film and television, and they champion that over voiceover so they don't take voiceover as seriously they think that's just a you know like a that's just a side thing that's just a little 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 little, little cartoon you know that, that that kind of attitude right well when i was younger it was it was like six people doing every every cartoon like casey Kasem everywhere 1970s right like mm-hmm. those Frank people Walker. were everywhere Right, exactly, right? But now, it, as I've gotten older, and e- even just into the 90s, right, um, and, and into the early 2000s, you're, I'm, my mind's being blown by the number of people, like Bruce Greenwood. Bruce, Bruce Greenwood's yeah. Batman is incredible. Oh. I, has he done anything else voiceover? I don't know, but I mean, he's... I don't think so. He's a name. Like, he's a name. Mm-hmm. Who's a name in the name in, a, in the film and TV and... And, and come doing this thing. And it doesn't seem as, uh, though I, 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 I believe what you're saying, I, I feel like it's changing. Like some of it's changing. Mm. No? You don't think? Slightly. Mm-mm. Okay. okay. Um, this is the reason why I think that. Yes, Bruce Greenwood is a name. But that, and I don't think that's why he got the job in this particular instance. Um, I just think he just, he does a great Batman. But let's take any animated movie you've seen in any theater. They hire celebrities. They don't hire voiceover. Look at, look at, look at, um, Shaggy in the new Scooby-Doo, right? They, uh, didn't use the, what's his name? The guy who's doing Shaggy now. I forget. Um, and I was just looking at it. I'll, it'll come to me probably, uh, tomorrow. But there's, uh, before, there's a guy who came in and, and, and filled Shaggy. Uh, he did, he was in the Scooby-Doo movies. Um, and he's been doing Shaggy and all the Scooby-Doo stuff for since since Casey Kasem retired the role and they're doing the Scooby-Doo movie and they hired a celebrity right and so he go he and so he put this thing out on Twitter like wow this was a this was a this was a bad way for me 
to receive this kind of news that I've been doing this role, this very iconic role. It's very dear to me for years. And when you guys want to make a film of it, you guys hire this celebrity, you know, and I get it at the end of the day, that stuff is a business. If that celebrity has, yeah, dollars, I hear what you're you saying. 32, yeah. But I think it also diminishes the value of voice actors uh, because not all film and TV people can do voiceover work. Because it's a different muscle. It's the same thing, yeah. but if you don't know how to how to how to change your muscle and utilize it in, t- in that in that way, it's 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 totally different. And that's kind of what I mean about they don't take voice actors and voice acting seriously. You know, where I'm sure there's some actors out there probably who do. But I just I'm just talking about the industry as 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 a as a unit, like subconsciously. I don't think they're doing. There's any like maliciousness in it. I just think you know, like voiceover actors you know could almost never like until something changes like play the guy in a movie in a in an animated movie you know they're going to right. hire a celebrity they're, if you, if it's iconic they're going to sonic the hedgehog that's not uh you know okay well whoever's playing sonic it's ben schwartz in the movie but it's not the guy who's been playing sonic for like the past three years because they hired right. ben schwartz a celebrity okay i see what and you're I saying it. yeah there's so with these things like these movies they're i guess they're 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 looking at this concept that they feel like it maybe has this combination of one it theoretically has a broader potential audience in some way but then also if you if not you've got uh it's a vector and if somebody sees a familiar name they might come see it even if they wouldn't normally or something something I, like I that i think it's kind of like that i think it's very much like because voiceover is very much a behind the curtain yeah work field uh, a lot of people know voice actors by their work and not their name and not their face, right? So right. when you when you go up to Kari Payton, you go, I loved you as Cyborg. I loved you as this guy from my childhood. You go to Frank Welker, oh my God, you're Scooby-Doo, you're Freddy, you know. Um, you know, so, but that's all behind animation and character designs. And then when you look at a celebrity who's on that TV show you like every week, you know, or that's that movie star who's in those movies that make millions of dollars, you go, wow, I love Tom Cruise. You know, wow, I love Michael B. Jordan. You know, he was great in Creed. You know, he was great in this. And because there's that star power and that spotlight that's on him, yeah. I just think that's 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 more eyes on your movie. Uh, a lot of people who maybe don't know who who Kari Payton is because they don't, well, they probably know who Kari Payton is because he's in The Walking Dead, but who don't know right. who, let's say, uh, Gray Griffin, Gray Delisle is, right? Because she does mostly voiceover if she's in this movie people might go well, who's that i don't you know or people are more inclined to see the movie based on the plot than if they hired angelina jolie and they go well angelina jolie's in this well i have to see it because angelina jolie's in it you know? right right no i hear what you're saying i hear what you're saying so in so in the last couple of years you're saying like think things have changed pretty significantly for you right so starting in when did yes. you say like 2016 2017 Starting 2017 is when everything was when the big shift happened. That's Big City Greens. That was Craig of the Creek. That was Young Justice. And that's when you started. That's when you started recording for these other shows, or that's when some mm-hmm. of them started to air. That's when that's I started when recording. Recording for those, mm-hmm. and so it takes yeah. the production of. I think Spider Man so- aired in 2017, but I started recording that Spider Man was the first kind of jump back into animation. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm-hmm. And then, so what? Now, I, I, I get this concept, this general concept. Somebody, you, you get a job. And you're doing the job and now someone else, you know, you, you, you audition for another job and you, people are like, oh, that, that person's on a show I've seen. Mm-hmm. Right. So we uh, immediately, I think some people who are hiring, you know, uh, there's a list of things, right. That immediately they know one, you show up, you know, like two, you, you show up and you do the work. Right. And yeah. you're, and you've got to be open to some kind of critique because I, you know, maybe they know like the voice director or the producer or somebody who knows that, well, they, they, they're going to give feedback to this person and clearly they can listen to feedback and do the things like, so you start getting this list of things that you can already just kind of check off as baseline skills that may, that to be perfectly honest, not everybody has like not right. everybody, unfortunately not everybody's going to get a job and show up. And it seems like, you know, one one have a job, but like yeah. people don't, people don't always do that and either show up physically or just show up mentally and emotionally and prepped and ready to do the work. Right. Um, and so, so now you get, so you get Spider-Man or you get some other stuff and then you get hired for that. And then it just mm. starts this chain reaction of like, oh, now you've been in these two, two things and now you've been in these three things. Right. 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 Like, right. 
I feel like Greg and Brandon are hiring for the best voice. Absolutely. But I, I asked them. I was like, mm, why me? Like, I get it. <laughs> like, but I was like, mm. like, you guys have like Nolan North and like, you know, Troy Baker on this show. Like, why did you? Because and I can't, and I know how interesting it's like, it's like, you know, there's oh, so many great voice actors out there there's so many great actors out there i mean og banks uh bumper robinson you know i was like yeah. i mean you could have brought Cardi Page. like why me and they were like we just liked what you did the most they were like we you you hit specific words for us that we we kind of wanted you wanted wanted to hear and you know we we just generally liked your performance we we only brought you in because we wanted to make sure you could play other people <laughs> we wanted to make sure you could you could be you know steel and holocaust if we needed you um uh-huh. but yeah like i was like are you guys sure like <laughs> you want- well, now i'm thinking of like oh we just wanted to make sure we could give you even more work yeah like right, they basically because just- if i couldn't if i couldn't play steel if i couldn't have a distinct voice for steel and, a, and another thing for holocaust you know then it would all sound like vic and they they probably don't want that you know car Payton plays like five people on the show and they all sound yeah they all sound different you know yeah, well, then you got Crispin, who they were like, "Don't make it different." He's like, "What? Don't make it different." Like, yeah. You're a clone. <laughs> yeah, you. they're like, "You're like yeah. six clones. Do all the clones mm-hmm. about the same, right?" Yeah, kind of thing. And he was like, "It drove me crazy." They're gonna think I'm a bad <laughs> voice actor, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I just think that's cool. Like, I think he even places some distinction on them. Like the the episode about the when they were working the hunter bow hunter security. Bow hunter security. I was like, oh yeah. I was like, yo, there's there's a difference between each of these guys, you know? Yeah, like, and. And in his interview, he and I want to ask you about this too because I found this fascinating. He was saying that when you're playing a character who's like this, who's got the same kind of voice, and you can kind of age up and age down, right? Apparently, that's a skill that boggles my mind for you guys mm-hmm. to be able to do, yeah. right? But in, in aside from that, he was like, "There's the psychology of the character, right?" Mm-hmm. Jim Jim Harper Guardian is Big Brother dude. Right. You know, he's very different than Will. He's very different right. than the original Roy, who's got all kinds of angst issues. You're right. And so they're the same genetically and they have the similar voices, but they have different psychologies behind them. Yeah. Right. And so when you're aging down your voice to do like different, you know, younger kid characters in different shows, or you do this, you know, this bald old guy that you were talking about <laughs> right. in your thing. Like, is that something you feel like you do either intuitively or, or a skill that you learn to be able to like flip, like look at like, is that what that, yeah. I'm sorry. Is that what that guy was saying? Fit. He was like, who is this? Who is this person? Be that person. Is that what he was trying yeah. to get at? Very similarly to that. Yes. Cause I think it all boils down to the truth of who this character is in their specific situation. Right. So if I'm doing Remy, Remy's at a completely different placement than Poncho in Craig of the Creek, who's at a different, very different place in, placement than Carter in Craig of the Creek in the same show. You know what I mean? Like I'm playing two kids with two distinct voices or two different voices in the same show. And it's because Poncho's whole deal is he's this like kid protector, dark brooding Batman-y esque character. <laughs> you I know, love in, I love him already. The, he's great. I, he's one of my favorite characters to play, but Carter is this kind of suave, debonair, like cardboard, you know. Uh, Wait, are you playing engineer. Bruce? Are you playing Bruce Wayne and Batman in this show? <laughs> that's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, like he's because, but at Carter's core, he's very he ha, he's got this like he's got a lot going on. He feels kind of ostracized in his community, you know. So he has this southern accent in the beginning, then it kind of drops out, and then you know. While Poncho's all cool and collected. And then Remy is all very much big eyed, you know, very much excited about everything, you know. There are, there are three distinct characters with, uh, and I think once you, you kind of drop into their truth, the psychology follows, your body follows. Well, then let's, let's, let's apply that. You've got three, get three very different characters in Young Justice. I know you only had a couple lines with Holocaust, right? Mm-hmm. We actually and had only- more. We yeah, he cut did, a but- bunch of pages. He had more. Oh, we, really? We had, for timing for the for timing of the episode, they told me because I was like, I watched it and I was like, mm, I remember us <laughs> a little bit more. Um, <laughs> wonder what happened. Um, but then so I asked Batias. He was like, Yeah, for time that episode was so long. We had to we had to cut 
we so we, we there's a lot a going on in that stuff. episode as it is yeah um and then you know and you've got steel too who this was the first time you know we, we he only gets one set of lines right and because mm-hmm, we'd mm-hmm. seen him in episode one in but episode didn't say one thing surprising to me i had no idea what was great about this is that i spent the first 10 episodes as a fan i spent the first 10 episodes like like <laughs> getting the getting the reward for all of my hard picketing work you know all my hard yeah. protesting and then and my reward was i spent the first nine episodes not knowing and what was going on at all so they were just as surprising and just as like yeah, i was with every twist and turn just like a fan just like everybody else and then right so 10 right. onward i knew what was happening <laughs> were you were you as surprised about how enormous steel's armor is in young justice as i was he makes he makes jefferson look like the yeah Adam. <laughs> he's it's so I cool entirely surprised because uh i did get to go to the studio and see oh. a bunch of, their, of their process so i met phil barasa there and he showed me the art <laughs> so, nice. yeah yeah that's cool i i guess that makes sense to me if you're doing that because they they have mentioned in the past that sometimes you guys can get art because you have it right for the character design so when you're doing the voices you have something to go off of i think right? once i got the art for vic which is like by the time i was recording the third episode i was in I kind of was like, oh, this informs so much. Like, I can make him sound like that now. Yeah. And, uh, but actually, they knew I was just such a huge fan. So they, you know, Greg brings that big thing of art, that big art book with all the scripts in it to every session. And he let me flip through it one session while I was waiting. I think I was early or something. Yeah. But he was just like, yeah, do you want to look through this? And that's when I that's when I got to find out Aqual- Aqualad was Aquaman. And I was like, yeah, sure. And that's yeah, had, when I exactly. saw yeah, <laughs> Halo's design for the first time. And, you know, seeing a lot of things that I probably can't say. <laughs> right, yeah, we'll, right we'll hold off on those. We don't want to be getting in trouble on this yeah. show either. But uh, uh, one thing before we go and before we wrap up here, I have to tell you, one of my favorite lines mm-hmm. from the whole first 13 episodes is yours. <laughs> really? And it is, it is Vic yelling at his dad saying, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to mess up the quote, but he's like, I'm not a three-year-old trying to get you to eat get my you to mud taste, pie. Yeah. This is mud my pie. life. And I was yeah. like, Oh my God, speak, mm-hmm. speak it. Like mm-hmm. I just, <laughs> it just hit me in the gut of like being a dad myself. Right. And mm-hmm. the, the comp, the complexities of being a dad and being a son, Mm-hmm. And and having to work through all that and seeing, you know, Vic go through that and like it was yeah. It I yeah. paused. I paused after that line and took a breath. Yeah. Um the way you delivered it as well. Like it it Thank probably you. could yeah. have come across as a, a as more of a humorous line than it was, but it absolutely mm-hmm. was not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted to make it a bit I wanted to give it kind of like Vic is kind of, he's kind of, it's like a a bit of humorous, but he's serious. He's like, yo, like, you know, like, I'm not a kid. Like, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not bothering you. I, you know, I want you to be there and you're not there. And, uh, I had, I had some stuff I I could draw from with Vic. So like this was the specific context of it. I loved, I loved it. I loved episode 10. I think it's my favorite. Another freak. It's my favorite. The emotional beats at that the last what five to ten minutes with Vic yeah. turning into and then Kari's Kari Payton's performance and turning in uh and Vic turning into cyborg and everything is just Yeah. And the beginning of the beginning of that too, because you know, the early early depictions of Vic were definitely like just mm-hmm. angry teenage guy, mm-hmm. right? And but the opening scenes with Vic where we hear him where he's talking to his dad, he's like, I'm trying to have a fun relationship with you like i'm trying to bond with you and you just put these walls up and you can't enjoy life with me it Mm. really counterpoints how you delivered those early lines that kind of joyous i love you dad i'm trying to i'm trying to have a common experience with you here yeah it's not working and then we get angry vic as well and it's like i'm feeling you buddy i i get i i know you were trying right you can see you've probably been trying your whole life yeah, I you loved know. it. It was like the my favorite is like you're not a freak. You think I could go back to? And I think this thing was a was a was a was an ad lib on my part. And I put this thing. I think that I made that. I I put that in there. I remember it being this hand in the script. And I think oh I like yeah, oh take. yeah. They want you think they're gonna let me catch a football with this football thing. with this this thing? Yeah, it was this yeah. hand in the script. And I was like, nah, it's a thing to him. You know, like he 
doesn't want oh that's that fantastic in his hand yeah yeah amazing i loved it i love that episode so much then the end when him he's staring he's staring at his at his new body in the rain and the sound oh. effects the sound effects of the mm-hmm. rain tinking the, the off rain the metal. on the metal yeah this, the music this season has just been blowing me away man <laughs> Yeah, the the scene with him and Halo and the 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 the, the, ho- the strings come in and I'm just like, oh my god, this is yeah. sad. Yeah, it's yeah. so good, man. It's so good. We we had the dynamic music partners on the show talking about mm-hmm. the music too, and and them being such a big fans of all the material. Uh, talking to you online, knowing that you are such an enormous fan of the mm-hmm. show and the characters, it warms my heart. It just I I love seeing. <laughs> when the people who are working on a show love the show and seem to love the show as much as we love the show. So thank you so much for that. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. I can't wait to see you in the back half of the, uh, of the season. Going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the watchtower. Uh, where can people find you out on earth prime? If they want to connect with you, uh, they can find me uh, at on Twitter at childish underscore Gamzino. That is also my Instagram handle childish underscore underscore Gamzino, that's kind of it. And you're pretty act. You're pretty active on Twitter. Yeah, I've seen you on there. Pretty active the on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on there a lot. Uh, so if you guys want to talk, say hi. Tell me what you think about Vic. <laughs> then uh, any questions you have about the process. Awesome. Thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us as well. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. And if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.